Hello everyone and welcome to a book haul. These ones are all ebooks. These are all ones that I got for free. Um, so <laughs> yeah, uh, these are all going to be, where is my notebook? Let me move stuff out of the way. Okay, I think historical, yes, these ones are all historical fiction. So if you like or are interested in possibly getting into historical fiction, I will be reading the synopsis of these, so maybe you'll know if this is something to look out for. Now, some of these I do find on occasion are available on Kindle Unlimited, so if you are a member of Kindle Unlimited, then obviously you can have access to these. And even if you want to buy your own copy, even if they are on Kindle Unlimited, you still have the option to purchase the book, and the price does fluctuate. When I got them, they were free, but I have seen the price fluctuate, usually within about a $5 range. So they're really not that expensive. And I will say before I get started, I'm already trying to get in Halloween spirit. I've got my gnome cross-stitch up uh, behind me. I'm happy. I've not got all of my Halloween stuff out yet. I'm slowly bringing this stuff out, savoring each time. My mom got me this little thing. Let me show you. <clears throat> my mom found this black cat at our local grocery store. So, just, it's like dressed as a jailbird pirate. <laughs> it's just so cute. So she got that for me, so I've got that on my bookcase. And then I got this shirt in the mail today. Love the black cat, it's dressed up as a witch, um, a ghost, a bat, I think this one's my favorite, and then in a jack-o'-lantern. And then I've got these earrings, which I had to get. I got these when I had to put my cat Ophelia down, um, when I started seeing a lot of the Halloween stuff, because I wanted more stuff that was black cat, because Ophelia was black, and so I got these. The other earring is the exact same, so just with some pumpkins. I'm excited, I love Halloween. I love the fall season. <laughs> all right, so let's go ahead and get into this. So again, these will all be historical fiction. If there are additional genre tags, I will tell you about this. I will be looking off to the side as I've got the synopsis of each book pulled up on my computer over here. And then I will tell you who is the author, if it's part of a series, and I will try and remember to tell you what the average star rating is and how many ratings there are on the book. So you know, for example, it was a five star, but there's only two ratings you know that the two people that rated it absolutely love the book, evidence according to that, at least that's my assumption, but anyway. Okay, so first off, I have Barcelona Bastard. This was written by Robert W. Lamont. No additional genre tags. This has 10 ratings with a 4.6 average, and looks like this is a standalone from what I can see. If it's part of a series, I'll let you know if it tells me which series it is and all of that, but this one says, in, in excuse me, 19... I was going to say 1917. I've got it switched. In 1719, William Tanya is born during the War of the Quadruple Alliance. The shadow of violence that surrounded his birth hangs over him like a darkening Atlantic Ocean storm, like, oh, like darkening Atlantic Ocean storm clouds. It is across this angry sea that he must set his course in search of both how his mother met his dem her demise and how to find his father's identity. On the sea, he is recruited as a merchant seaman, smuggler, and pirate. He is drawn into the service of the Spanish king during the War of Junkin's Ear to defend the Caribbean possession of Cartagena. His heroics during this battle earn him entrance into a social setting for which he is unprepared. Doesn't make me feel any way. Um, and... Also, to let you know, I have not, I just got them because they're free. I did not read the synopsis, so I have no idea what any of these are about. So I'm learning what these are about with you. And so you're getting genuine, ooh, this sounds interesting to me, or, eh, we'll see. Eventually I'll pick it up. Probably, this one would probably be one where the synopsis doesn't do anything for me. This would be one that I would pick up if there's a particular word like Barcelona or Bastard, something like that. Something to do with the title or a ship on the cover, water on the cover, takes place at sea for a prompt for a readathon. That would most likely be what I would use, pick this book up for, unless I'm suddenly in the mood for it. But this one does not spring to the top of my I want to read list in my mind. So, next I have Ireland. I, nope. <laughs> Ireland isn't like the subtitle, it's 
Where the Cricket Sings, and then it says it's a thrilling historical fiction from 1930s Spain and France to 1950s Ireland, the man and woman who openly defied fascism. This was written by D.T. Murphy, so the title is Where the Cricket Sings. This has 32 ratings with a 4.06 average. No additional genre tags to tell you about. It says, Lucan stands on the cliff tops outside St. Jean-Luc de Luz in France, looking across to Spain, the land he is forbidden to return to under penalty of death, but knows that he will. In northern Spain, 1936, fascist forces are imposing their deadly ideology, think like us or die. The centers are executed. Lucan urges his fellow citizens to revolt for to revolt for better working conditions, and his wife, Mirren, a nurse, treats left-wing sympathizers, fatal actions under the regime. Both are forced to flee with their daughter and son. Finding no work in France, they reach out to an old friend of Lucan's who helps them create a new life in Ireland. The fresh start, however, is threatened when they discover the shadowy forces and influences they thought they had left they thought had been left behind, are still in pursuit. And it says this is inspired by actual characters and events. It is a beautiful written story of exile and sanctuary set in contemporary historical times. A story of unrequited love, of tragedy and loss, and ultimately of the reaffirmation of the human soul. This one sounds intriguing. Like this one I am more inclined to pick up sooner rather than later. Okay, so this next one that I have is... Punish Not the River. This is book number one in the Poland Trilogy. So I'm just pulling up the series, and it looks like there are three primary works. Yes, there's three books in this. Well, duh, it says it's a trilogy. Hello, Christine. What the heck were you thinking? Trilogy is three books. Yes, there are three books. Okay, hang on. My thing froze. There we go. Okay, this was written by James Conroyd Martin. It has 3,737 ratings with a 4.08 average. Uh, let's see. Poland, Romance, 18th Century, and War are the additional genre tags. A panoramic and epic novel in the grand romantic style, Push Not the River, is the rich story of Poland in the late 1700s, a time of heartache and turmoil as the country's once peaceful people are being torn apart by neighboring countries and divided loyalties. It is then at the young and vulnerable age of 17 when Lady Anna Maria Berezowska loses both of her parents and must leave the only home she has ever known. With Empress Catherine's Russian armies uh, streaming in to take their spoils, Anna is quickly thrust to a world of love and hate, loyalty and deceit, patriotism and treason, life and death. Even kind Aunt Stella, Anna's new, uh, Anna's new guardian, who soon comes to, pers to personify Poland's courage and spirit, can't protect Anna from the uncertain future of the country. Anna, a child no longer, turns to love and comfort in the form of Jan, a brave patriot and architect of democracy, unaware that her beautiful and enigmatic cousin Zofia has already set her sights on the handsome young fighter. Thus, Anna has unwitting, un, oh, thus Anna walks unwittingly into Zofia's jealous wrath and darkly sinister intentions. Forced to survive several tragic events, many of them outstretched by the crafty Zofia, or orchestrated, not outstretched, I'm sure they'll be outstretched, but it's orchestrated, orchestrated by Zofia, uh, a strengthened Anna begins to learn to place herself in the way of destiny, for love and for country. Heeding the proud spirit of her late father, Anna becomes a major player in the fight against the countries who come to partition her beloved Poland. Push Not the River is based on the true 18th century diary of Anna Maria Berezowska, a Polish countess who lived through the rise and fall of the historic 3rd of May Constitution. Vivid, romantic, and thrillingly paced, it paints the emotional and unforgettable story of the metamorphosis of a nation and of a proud and resilient young woman. That sounds interesting. 
Okay, next up, this, the cover that I'm seeing on Goodreads, I'm immediately intrigued by. And this is the Auschwitz Protocol. I hope I said that right. This is book number one in the Sakura Files series, written by Jack Carnegie. And this one has, it looks like, three books. Yes, three books in this one. This has 1,792 ratings with a 4.47 average. Additional genre tags are Holocaust, World War II. So, okay. It says, retired U.S. detective Emil Janowitz lied to his wife for nearly 40 years, having lost his entire family whilst an inmate of Auschwitz. I'm not going to say this right. Auschwitz. Breaker now. Mm. It was simply easier on his soul to invent a past than face up to the demons buried deep inside. Life was good, but when the ma mail arrived bringing a letter which would result in a voyage of discovery, denunciation, and confrontation with the past, life is a journey. History, life is a journey. History should not be forgotten. The evil still exists. Ain't that the truth? Yeah, evil always exists. Because there are evil people in the world. Sorry, I had to pull the computer a little closer. I'm just not seeing like I used to be able to. Next up I have Justina, daughter of Spartacus. And immediately, I have not seen the whole movie, but there's this clip that goes around with like, Sparta! I've seen that clip so many times, and that's what comes to my mind every time I see Spartacus or Sparta. But I have not seen the movie. This is number one, book number one in the Justina Saga series. And there are two, three, four, five, seven, seven books in this series. This was written by Ryan Liu. This has 195 ratings with a 4.04 average. No additional genre tags to tell you about. The story Rome never wanted to be revealed. For 2,000 years, the rise and fall of Julius Caesar has captivated the world. All know his name. Few know the truth. Love, honor, treachery. Justina, a name lost to history. A young girl, barely a woman, raised in the Roman elite. When her true identity is discovered, the revelation will send her world spinning and propel her down a path toward her destiny and Caesar, with enemies and lies encompassing her entire existence. Her true past will determine her incredible future and that of the entire Republic. Power, secrets, betrayal. While Caesar builds his power in Rome, weaving a web of spies and alliances, one young girl's fate is on a collision course with his own. Rome's biggest challenge of the past 20 years came from a man known as Spartacus. Now his unknown daughter threatens all that Rome has built. Next, I have Yelling at the Stars, written by Michael Herzog. This has 25 ratings with a 4.48 average. No additional genre tags to tell you about. Asher seems to make his dad furious no matter what he does. In hopes of getting his dad back to normal, whatever that is, he looks for a way to fix it all. But he soon finds that he's bitten off more than he can chew. When he discovers clues suggesting his grandpa's death may not have been as natural as he was led to believe. The secrets he uncovers might change everything, but what does a nuclear bomb from 60 years ago have to do with his grandpa's death and his dad hating the world? Asher, Mari, and their quirky little sisters team up to solve the mystery before Asher's dad destroys the family. It doesn't take long, though, for Asher to realize that trying to save someone else can end up putting yourself at risk. Through the support of Mari and their top-secret spy sisters, Asher uncovers enraging revelation. Rev yeah, revelations about his grandfather's death, but realizes a little too late that some mysteries are better left unsolved. This sounds like a middle grade. So, The Broken Hallelujah, written by Wendy H. Adair. This has 60 ratings with a 4.35 average. No additional genre tags to tell you about. It says, The Broken Hallelujah is a heart-wrenching tale of family the lasting impact of lies, and the human consequences of truth. 1969, Martin Carter's plan is to survive his tour to Vietnam and return to his wife and newborn daughter. He refused his commission to keep from lying to his men, 
but ultimately becomes a leader to his team and to a small group of Vietnamese villagers. He must find whoever is running drugs through the camp before they can safely get home. 2019, Robin Carter's plan is to care for her grandmother and restart her career after a disastrous divorce. Martin's footlocker is unexpectedly delivered to their home. He's been missing in action for 50 years. His journals record his harrowing 16 months in Vietnam. Robin is determined to find the grandfather she never knew before her grandmother's memory fades. Okay. Next, I have Wrath. It says this is a hard man novel. I'm not quite sure what that means, but this was written by Howard McEwen. This has 59 ratings with a 3.92 average. And if I remember right, before I scroll down, I think this is a queer book. Um, I think this is the one that said male male. Yes, this is a male male romance. Uh, I don't care about updating the cover. Okay, uh, let's see. William William Goebel was a hard man born to a hard time, and politics is a hard business, especially in 1890s Kentucky. He was a man unafraid to turn the bluegrass blood red in his pursuit of power. Wrath is a story of two men, the first William Goebel, a Kentucky politician who turned his state into an armed camp. The second was a solitary mountain man, as hard as Goebel, who delivered the final act of retribution from the barrel of a musket. Murder, proverbial backstabbing, backroom deals, and some of the most corrupt political acts imaginable. It, that part is, that one sentence is an Amazon review quote. But the only thing I have to tell you is that this is a male-male romance. So I don't know if it's going to be spicy or what. So I that I can't tell you about. Not until I read it, and I don't know when I'll get to it. So, But it sounds good. Uh, let's see. Cor corruption in books tends to make me mad, but at the same time, I do find it very intriguing. So, next up I have Kim. This is a, I believe, a classic just because of the author. This author actually wrote the Jungle Book series, and that's Rudyard Kipling, and I have yet to read the Jungle Book, but I do have the Jungle Book. This has 38,275 ratings with a 3.7 average. And it says India, Adventure, and British. So those are the additional tags. Set after the Second Afghan War, which ended in 1881, but before the third fought in 1919, probably in the period 1893 to 1899. The novel is notable for its detailed portrait of the people, culture, and varied religions of India. The book presents a vivid picture of India, its teeming populations, religions, and superstitions, and the life of the bazaars and the road. Two men, a boy who grows into early manhood and an old aesthetic, aesthetic? I don't know. Uh, an old priest, okay, an old priest, the Lama, are at the center of the novel. A quest faces them both. Born in India, Kim is nevertheless white, a Shaheem. I think that's how you say it. I don't know. Uh, while he wants to play the greatest game of imperialism, he is also spiritually bonded to the Lama. His aim as he moves chameleon-like through the two cultures is to reconcile these opposing strands, while the Lama searches for redemption from the Wheel of Life. A celebration of their friendship in a beautiful but often hostile environment, Kim captures the opulence of India's exotic landscape overlaid by the uneasy presence of the British Raj. Could have said that wrong, but I think that's how it said. Okay, next up I have Out of the Storm. This is actually book number 0 0.5 out of Beacons of Hope. And it says there are seven works. So we have the novella, which is the one I'm telling you about, or I'm assuming it's a novella just from the 0 0.5. Could be wrong. Um, Out of the Storm by Judy Headland. And then there's book number one, two, three, four, five... Yeah, and then it looks there it says there's another 0 0.5 that, but it's by a different author, and it's a collection of five novellas. So I'm not quite sure on that. 
So it looks like five books with a prequel. So Out of the Storm has 2,753 ratings with a 3.86 average. So we have romance. It does say novella. Clean romance and Christian are the other ones. So uh, if you don't like Christian fiction, obviously you'll know to give this one a pass. But this one does say Christian fiction and Christian romance. So, and if you want books that are clean, so have no spice, then this sounds like one that would be more up your alley. So, it says, having grown up in a lighthouse, loneliness is all Isabel Thornton has ever known, and all she assumes she ever will know. But when her lightkeeper father rescues a young man from the lake, her sheltered world is turned upside down. That's it. That's all it says. It does say this is 141 pages, and that's all I know. So obviously it's going to be a romance, I'm assuming, from the main female character Isabel, or Isabella, Isabel, and this guy that her father pulled from the ocean. Or from the lake, I should say. It does say lake, so I don't know. Alrighty, continuing on, I have By Royal Appointment. It says this is a love affair that almost destroyed the monarchy. So that tells me this is going to be based in England. This was written by A. O'Connor. It has 838 ratings with a 4.17 average. As far as additional genre tags, British is the only tag, so I was correct with England. Okay, so British. And it says, in 1861, 19-year-old Bertie, Prince of Wales, began an affair with the Irish act actress Nellie Clifton. By Royal Appointment is a fictionalized account of their story based on true events. I like it when I know that a book is based on true events. I know things are going to be changed and fictionalized, but I like it when it says it's based on true events. That intrigues me a lot more. Okay. In the years following the Great Famine of the 1840s, Queen Victoria has become deeply unpopular in Ireland. In 1861, as an official visit from the monarch is planned to win over her Irish subjects, her son Bertie is dispatched to Country Kildare for military training as part of the Charm Offensive. I don't know what that is. <laughs> or if that's even a real thing. If you know, let me know. Otherwise, I can just look it up when I remember. <laughs> so, Bertie has undergone a life of duty, protocol, and harsh educational regime. As a frantic search is underway to find him a suitable princess to marry, he relishes the prospect of freedom from court, from court life in Ireland. There, he is quickly introduced to a life of decadence and soon presented to the notorious actress Nellie Clifton. Nellie is, a, is as famous for her shocking behavior as her beauty. A, fam a famine orphan who has climbed the ladder of society by any means she could, even she is shocked to find herself in the company of the Prince of Wales. When Bertie and Nellie fall in love, the royal family is engulfed in a scandal threatening the future of the monarchy, and Nellie becomes a pawn in a dangerous world of power, politics, and blackmail. That book sounds interesting. Okay, next up I have The Wide Awake Hat, written by Amanda Georgis. This has 212 ratings with a 4.43 average. No additional genre tags to tell you about. It says, From the Scottish Highlands to remote New Zealand, life was harsh for the early pioneers who ventured into a new land far across the seas where opportunity beckoned for those who could endure the hardships. On Boxing Day, 1848, Sophia steps ashore with her new husband, George, and begins her perilous journey inland to seek a place to call home. Her hope for the child she carries to be born is oh, for carries to be born in a house that they built together does indeed come true. Sophia and George are joined by other young folk who form a small but growing community of fellow pioneers, banding together to forge li a life in this land of promise. However, not all pioneers are honest and true, as Sophia discovers to her cost. When tragedy strikes, the enigmatic James Mackenzie steps in to help our family, and Sophia's life takes an unexpected turn. James Mackenzie is not a character of fiction. Okay, so based on a true person? Hmm. There is no doubt he existed. In fact, the high plateau where Sophia settled now bears his name. 
but the tales that surrounded his conviction and imprisonment for sheep wrestling are shrouded in mystery. No one knows what became of him for sure, though stories abound. Along with his clever and faithful colleague, Dog Friday, he, his exploits have become legends. Perhaps there is more to tell of James McKenzie and his influence on the remotely beautiful high country surrounded by snow-capped mountains. Now, I do see on the cover of the image that I am seeing on Goodreads, it does say uh, book number one of the Apple Cross Saga, but it doesn't tell me how long this series is or anything like that. Moving on, I have 18 in 1942, written by K.J. McCall. This is 82 ratings with a 4.48 average and no additional genre tags to tell you about. It says, in February 1945, 350 captured US, U.S. soldiers were taken from a German POW camp and transported by cattle car to Berga, slave labor camp for European Jews. Inspired by this shocking and little-known event, K.J. McCall weaves fact and fiction in a story that begins in a small Pennsylvania town in September 1941, when America is still at peace and much of the world is already at war. Corbin O'Connell is then just a high school senior, stuck on the family farm, snared by the conniving Velma, hopelessly in love with Daisy, his best friend's girl. All he knows of the war is what he sees in newsreels, but everything changes on December 7, 1941, and 1942 finds him standing in line to register for the draft only two weeks after graduation. He's headed for big trouble and doesn't know it. To him, the war is simply a convenient escape from his troubles. And, blind to reality, he's eager to enlist. But he will see. Far from home, he's swept in a world of conflict. And life veers off its own mad direction when he's captured by the Germans. Hmm? Okay. Back then, no one had... Cho uh, no one... Back then, one had no choice in the matter. Thrown into the war of all wars just by being born. There was no getting around it. Not if you were 18 in 1942. Okay, so, so this makes me think of my great uncle. He was a fighter pilot from the U.S. when the U.S. joined World War II. He was a fighter pilot, and his plane was blown down, and thankfully he survived that crash. I don't know the events surrounding that, um, but he survived. He was taken hostage by German Nazi regime, so he was a POW, my great uncle. This synopsis kind of hits home, um, and this is all what I'm getting from him telling my mom and then her telling me. So he was taken captive, so he was a POW. He was on a boxcar. They were taking him to a concentration camp with a bunch of other POWs. Uh, and then, as he has told this event... He has said that all of a sudden the boxcar just stopped and all the German Nazi people just scattered and ran. So he didn't know if they were laying in wait so that when they tried to get off of the boxcar, the POWs, that they would be shot dead. He didn't know if it was rigged to explode or what was happening. So they, all the POWs stayed on the boxcar. He says they waited. I don't know how long they waited, but he says that they waited. And then all of a sudden they see this line of people getting closer and closer. And they didn't know if these were allies or enemies. They had no idea. So they just sat and waited. Didn't know if what their fate was going to be, if they were basically rescued or going to be killed and what was going to happen, depending on if it was friend or foe. Turns out it was friend. Um, I don't know if they were American or whatever, but either way, the, the people that were marching towards this boxcar that my uncle and other POWs were on were against Hitler and the Nazi people. So uh, they, they were set free. They were rescued from being POWs and that. So that, where it's saying um, they were in a boxcar, they were being cattle, you know, carried, that just, if I read whenever it is, not if, whenever it is that I pick this book up, my uncle, his name was Gordon, um, my uncle Gordon will definitely be on my mind when I pick this book up, um, just because of that little snippet alone. I imagine it's just going to be a little bit of the story, but that's cool. I, I don't know. It's just that, just that little connection. It's just, I don't know. So that's, that's the information that I have. So, okay, let's go ahead and move on to the next book. I have another World War II one because it has the swastika on the cover. 
I think the image on this cover that I am seeing, which is hopefully the one that you're seeing, was a, um, I think it was a metal, at least it's one that I've seen in some fiction movies. Like the first one that comes to my mind is uh, The Sound of Music, but it has the bird with the wings on it and then he's holding what looks like a wreath, but then there's a swastika right smack in the middle of that part, whatever this bird or eagle is holding. So I think it was some kind of a medal for the Nazi people. I don't, I don't know. Anyway, it says Enemies, and this is a war story written by Kenneth Rosenberg. This has 1,465 ratings with a 4.46 average. Additional genre tags is World War II. So I was correct with once I saw the swastika saying it's World War II. A gripping novel based on astonishing true events. In the summer of 1941, and two young men from Chicago embark on an epic journey. First, they road trip to, down to Mexico, where they spend a few idle months before hopping a fighter, before hopping a freighter to Japan. That makes sense. Okay, from there, they sign on as merchant seamen for a three-month voyage to Europe, landing occupi in occupied France on the very day that Nazi Germany declares war on the United States. Their adventure has suddenly taken a dark turn. Wolfgang Virgin, I'm guessing is how that's said, and Herbie Haupt are American citizens, though German by birth. Both have lived in America since the age of five, yet now they are faced with a harrowing choice. They can join a Nazi sabotage mission heading to the United States or be drafted to the German army and sent to the Russian front. One chooses the first option and the other is the second, but will either survive? Mm, that sounds interesting. Okay. While this fragment of history is mostly forgotten today, the episode became one of the most sensational news stories of its time, garnering intense national interest. A war story is a fictionalized version of this true story sticking as close to the facts as possible. Okay. Next, I have The Outlaws. This is book number one in the Adderbrook, Adderbrook Family Saga. This has two books so far. And I'm not sure when this the second book was released, but there's at least two in the series. This was written by Jason Vale. It has 982 ratings with a 4.34 average. No additional genre tags to tell you about. It says, Eustace Fitzwalter, Giselle de Hafton, and Robert Adderbrook could not, be more, could not be more different. Eustace is the bastard son of an earl, Giselle the sheltered daughter of a doting gentry father, and Robert the son of an impoverished village carpenter. In ordinary times, their lives would not intersect. But when Robert breaks his uncle out of Earl Roger Fitzwalter's uh, Gaul, Gaul? I don't know, G-A-O-L, I have no idea what that is. He sets in motion a series of events that ends that sends their lives colliding in a maelstrom of murder and revenge that drives them all outside the laws and customs of England. Step in the tumultuous years of the 12th century and stand alongside Eustace as he ske schemes to inherit his father's title, lands, and power using every means within his grasp. Giselle as she fights to free herself from a forced marriage and to save her inheritance, and Robert as he struggles to raise to rise above the limitations of his birth in the face of Eustace's quest for vengeance. A saga to rival Ken Follett's Pillars of Earth, the outlaws sweep serene English villages and quiet forest glens to French battlefields, remote Welsh fortresses, and even the court of King Henry II, where nobles and clergy vie for power and wealth, and disputes are often descended with steel, decided with steel and blood. They're also probably descended into that too. But <laughs> the Outlaws is true to please fans of Stephen Adderbrook mysteries, for it reveals the truth about the founding power, powerful Adderbrook family, a secret that family would sooner forget. Next, I have Orphan Train Escape. This is book number one in the Hearts on the Rails series. And this book, this series has, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, six books in this series. This was written by Rachel Wesson. 
It has 6,821 ratings with a 4.28 average. Uh, let's see, romance and Christian or Christian fiction are the additional genre tags, as well as coming of age. Okay, Bridget Collins is in dire straits. She needs to get out of New York, fast. With two siblings under her wing, her options are limited. Her priest sends her as an outplacement agent on the orphan trains that run from New York to out west. With almost 40 orphans under her care, she's relieved. She's relieved fellow and more experienced outplacement agent, Carl Watson, is there to guide her. Okay. Uh, but Carl is dealing with his own trauma and finds it difficult to handle the pain the orphans are dealing with. Through tears and laughter, everyone on the orphan train has a lesson to teach about love, life, and loyalty. And Bridget finds a new unexpected calling. Every child deserves a happy home, and Bridget is determined to do whatever it takes to ensure that happens, no matter what the cost. She is correct. Every child does deserve a happy home. She is correct with that. Next, I have Innocence Lost. This is book number one in the Bootleggers Chronicles series, and it looks like there's five, one, two, three, four, yes, five books in this series. This was written by Sherilyn Dector, De yeah, Dector, 220 ratings with a 3.84 average. Uh, additional genre tags, we have mystery, paranormal, fantasy, and historical romance. Okay. It says, in a city of bootleggers and crime, one woman must rely on a long dead lawman to hunt down justice. Philadelphia, 1924, Maggie Barnes doesn't have much left. After the death of her husband, she finds herself all alone to care for her young son and look after their run-down house. As if that weren't bad enough, prohibition has turned her neighborhood into a bootleggers playground. To keep the shoddy roof over their heads, she has no choice but to take on borders with criminal ties. When her son's friend disappears, Maggie suspects the worst. The local politicians and police don't seem to have any interest in an investigation. With the child's life on the line, Maggie takes the case and risks angering the enemy living right under her nose. Maggie's one adventure may be her oldest tenant. Oh, Maggie's one advantage, not adventure, advantage. Maggie's one advantage may be her oldest tenant, the ghost of a Victoria-era cop. With his help, can she find justice in a lawless city? It says, if you like headstrong heroes, prohibition area, criminal underworlds, and a touch of the paranormal, then you'll love this book. Okay. Next, I have A Pledge to Fight Injustice. It says this is a historical Western adventure novel. This is written by Johnny Burns with 364 ratings and a 4.36 average. That subtitle, A Historical Western, just says the additional genre tag is a Western. So... And it says, As a bounty hunter, Jensen leads a simple life, providing for his orphan sisters from what he earns. As soon as he is offered a large sum of money to catch a criminal, he feels as if his prayers have been answered. Yet, when he discovers that the thief is just a desperate girl, his sense of right and wrong challenges his need for money. Will Jensen take the girl back to the man who hired him, or will he be faced with violent retribution instead? It may be time for Jensen to bend the rules a little bit, even at the risk of losing everything. Since losing both parents, Tilly has been living on the streets, stealing from unsuspecting passerby in order to survive. However, she does have one rule to follow. She only robs the rich. Little did she know that stealing from Fabian Poole would set her on a path to ruin. Will Tilly find a way to escape punishment from the theft she has committed? The cat and mouse game has just begun. Jensen and Tilly will soon realize that it's not just a stolen wallet at stake, but something far more important to Fabian. With shots file fired and a chase through trains, towns, and circuses across the state, they must join forces if they are to uncover the truth. Is there any chance for them to, for them to solve the mysterious puzzle and live to fight another day? I don't know. I guess we'll see. 
All right, this next book is called Coming Apart. It says this is a novel of the Great Depression. This is book number one in the Ava and Claire series, and it looks like there are three books in this series. This is written by Kara Heenan. It has 333 ratings with a 4.63 average. No additional genre tags to tell you about. No one knows you like a sister. Ava has always been poor, so she doesn't think the Great Depression will change anything. But when her mother dies and her coal miner husband loses his job, Ava's, Ava's certain, certainty falters. The last thing she needs is a letter from her estranged sister asking for the impossible. Claire is everything she could ever want, except the child she promised her husband. Oh, Claire has everything. She, okay, she's not everything. She has everything. Claire has everything she could ever want. Okay, except a child. When her sister's life falls apart, she reaches out to help and finds the missing piece of her own marriage. So, a child is what I'm thinking. With everything at stake, Ava must choose. Give up one child to save the rest or keep the family together and risk losing it all. If you like strong, resourceful women, which I do, well-developed historical themes and heartfelt family drama, yes please, then Coming Apart is your next rainy day read. Next I have The Commandant's Daughter. I hope I said that right. This is book number one in the Hannah Hanny Winter. Not quite sure how to say that. And it looks like there are four, yes, four books in this series and it looks like there are Looks like it's World War II from what I can see from the images. I guess we'll see. This was written by Katherine Hoken. This has 1,884 ratings with a 4.13 average. Uh, World War II, I was correct, and Holocaust are the additional genre tags. It says, 1933 Berlin. Ten-year-old Hanny Foss stands by her father's side watching the torchlit a procession to celebrate Adolf Hitler as Germany's new leader. As the lights fade, she knows her safe and happy childhood is about to change forever. Practically overnight, the father she adores becomes unrecognizable, lost to his ruthless ambition to oversee the infamous concentration camp. Ooh. Twelve years later, as the Nazi regime crumbles, Hanny, I'm guessing it's Hanny, because it's H-A-N-N-I, so Hanny, Hanny hides on the fringes of Berlin society in the small lodging house, house she's been living in since running away from her father's home. In stolen moments, she develops the photographs she took to record the atrocities in the camp, the empty food bowls and hungry eyes, and the vows to get some measure of justice for the innocent people she couldn't help as a child. But on the day she plans to deliver these damning photos to the Allies, Hanny comes face to face with her father again. Rainer Foss is now working with the British forces, his past safely hidden behind a new identity, and he makes it clear that he will go to deadly lengths to protect his secret. In that moment, Hanny hatches a dangerous plan to bring her father down. Ooh, <laughs> definitely intrigued now. Uh, but how far is she willing to go for revenge and at what cost? Female revenge, yes please. I do like a good female revenge story. So, I don't know why, it's just, Something about that just intrigues me. Okay. I am on the last grouping. <coughs> Next up, I have Impossible Dream. This is book number one in the Percy Place series. This was written by Gemma Jackson. It has 2,618 ratings with a 4.28 average. There are three books in this series. Additional genre tags, we have Ireland, Romance, Adult, and that's it. Okay, it says, In 1898, three young girls leave a Dublin orphanage to enter a life of domestic service. They are placed in the home of Captain Charles Whitmore, but soon discover that the household is in turmoil. Charles, hoping to amass a fortune, is preparing to set off on a long sea voyage, deliberately leaving his wife Georgiana, almost penniless, to fend for herself and the servants. His wife Georgiana, almost penniless, to fend for herself and the servants. 
Georgiana, who has been desperate to break free from a life of violent marital abuse, is relieved that he will be gone for some years. But, nevertheless, the future is frightening. Then help comes from an unexpected quarter, an organization that helps women escape lives of abuse or genteel poverty makes Georgiana an offer. They propose that her house should become a school designed to train such women to seek employment in the American West. The very idea <clears throat> is at once shocking and appealing. Can Georgiana step into the unknown and lead the women under her care into the future? The orphan maids listen and wonder, can they too dare to dream of a better life for themselves? Next up, I have The Sense of It, Living for Peace. This was written by Linda Degree. This has five ratings with a 4.4 average and no additional genre tags to tell you about. It says, the Vietnam War is raging when James decides to drop out of high school during his senior year. Why, his sister questions, because I learned from experiences. I do not do well learning from books as you do. Let's see. Okay, but you need a high school diploma to get a good job, and, there's a, and there is a war on. You will surely be drafted. I will not fight in a war I do not believe in. I will not put myself in the position of killing another human being just because my country is in a war with his country. I love my country, Margie, but I am going to live out my Christian values. So this sounds like it is a Christian fiction just from that. It says, join James and Margie in this coming-of-age book where they each search out careers where they can discover their own personal sense of it and live for peace using their own unique interests and talents. This book is written as letters intertwined with poetry. Okay. It also contains questions and letters from veterans, a military recruiter, and some politicians. Okay. I'm a little bit more intrigued just from that little bit right there. Next up is Out of the Bower. It says this is a Durban family novel, which leads me to think it's part of a series or a collection of standalones, maybe. Um, but it doesn't say that it's a series and what number it is. But this was written by A.E. Walnuffer. 55 ratings with a 4.36 average. Additional genre tag is Regency Romance. Okay? London, 1817. When Barclay Durbin, a young street preacher, encounters Honora Goodwin, injured on a London street, he doesn't know she was just she has just escaped from Titiana's bower. A, which is a brothel. Okay, so it says a brothel. Taking her to his ancestral home to recover amongst his family, he falls in love with a vivacious girl and comes to believe that she is divinely appointed to become his wife. Honora begins to feel similarly and knows that the good-hearted gentleman's attentions would likely ensure her future happiness, but she's intent on liberating Cecilia Woodlow, the friend she was forced to leave behind at the Bower. Did I say burrow? Bower. It's Bower. Telling Barclay only parts of her own story, Honora enlists the besotted young man to help her. When their plan goes awry, Honora realizes that, the, that only the truth can deliver them from the emotional and societal maelstrom in which they find themselves. But if she divulges all, what will become of Honora and Barclay's budding attachment? And will Cecilia ever gain her freedom? Out of... Okay, it says that this is a tale of forbidden romance, an ardent of friendship, and ever essential redemption of self. Sexual incidents in this book are described in limited and non gratuitous detail. In other words, not explicit is my understanding of that. Next up, make sure I've got the right. Uh, the mouse correctly. Okay, is Fortune's Child. This is book number one in the Theo Theodora duology. So duology, two books. This was written by James Conroy Martin. It has 790 ratings with a 4.26 average. And Greece is the additional genre tag. Okay, I haven't read a book set in Greece, so this would be interesting to read. Let's see. Okay, Theodora, actress, prostitute, mistress, feminist, and Byzantine empress of the civilized world. 
Stephen, handsome, Syrian boy, wizard's apprentice, palace eunuch, and secretary to the empress. How does this unlikely pair become such allies that one day Empress Theodora asks Stephen to write her biography? Yes, hello, Bobby. Yes, hello, I hear you. You can come up. From a very young age, Theodora, daughter of a circus bear keeper in Constantinople, sets her sights well above her station in life. Her exquisite beauty sets her apart on stages and in the eyes of men. Stephen, a Syrian lad of striking good looks, is sold by his parents to a Persian wizard who teaches him a skill and languages that will serve him well. So this sounds like it's going to have, um, it's a historical fiction, but it sounds like it's going to have fantastical elements. By the time Destiny brings them together in Antioch, Theodora has undergone heart-rending trials and a transformation, while Stephen has been sold again and castrated. Ooh. Discover the enduring bond that, however imperfect, prompts Theodora as Empress to request Palace Eunuch, uh, Palace Eunuch Stephen to write her biography. Okay. All right, let's move on to the next book. I have Into the Snow. This is doesn't give me a link to show me how many are in this, but it is part of a series, and it says it's book one of the Jedediah Chronicles. This was written by John Irwin. 152 ratings with a 4.28 average. Additional genre tags is Western. In the, um, okay, yeah. In the summer of 1858, Jedediah P. Carpenter finds himself orphaned at the age of 16 on the plains of Nebraska Territory. Faced with the choice between making his way west to Oregon to join his uncle and aunt or heading southwest to Pikes Peak Country to try his hand at gold prospecting, his fate is sealed by forces beyond his control. Join Jed as he pursues a life of his own, making the American West with the help of generous mountain men and Plains Indians, an itinerant Methodist preacher, and the alluring Emma Cooper. That's all it says. So, still don't know. I guess we'll see. And because he's 16, I'm wondering if it's a, like either an adult reflecting back on the YA time or if it's going to stay as a YA. I don't know. Okay, this next one is called Viking. This is book number one in the Viking Adventures series, written by Ollie Asil and Tony Bakajord. I could have said those names way wrong. There are five books in the Viking series. Okay, and I I have read the Faithful and the Fallen series by John Gwynn, which is very much like Viking vibes. Loved it, so I'm very intrigued just because the title is Viking. I am finding I like the Viking vibes. This one, as far as genre tags, it says young adult, fantasy, and it also says short stories. Uh, it says the Kindle edition is 159 pages, so this is a short story or a novella. Okay, so 1,033 ratings, 3.84 average. I'm sure I said the uh, author's names wrong. <laughs> so, because they have like those little, like there's a, the A in the first, the one of the author's last names has a little U or V symbol above it. I don't know. History is about to change in the hands of the unlikeliest of culprits. A Viking raid hits a small village in Northumbria. On board one of the ships is a terrified Ulv. U-L-V. I don't know. Ulv. The youngest of the crew, he is not a Viking. Not a warrior. Not a fighter. Despised by most of the herd, he has to prove himself worthy as a raider. His honor and his life is at stake as he faces a battle with enemies on both sides. Standing on the pier, Marcus watches in horror as the Viking ships appear. This time, he is old enough to fight, to stand side by side with the other men against the mighty foe, the Scourge of the North. At least he hopes he can show the Northmen uh, slow the Northmen down so that his little sister Julia can get away. In a twist of fate, both teenage boys end up hiding in a cellar, 
From that moment, their destiny is intertwined in a relationship spanning from friends to enemies, from thrall and master to weapon brothers, and from friendship to hate. Um, okay, so it's, they're a Viking misfits. And they're on a path to change their course of history. So, uh, looks like the series is called Two... Well, it says Viking Ventures, but then it says at the bottom, it says the epic story of Two Kings. So maybe it's changed? I don't know, but there we go. That one I am intrigued by, mostly because it's Vikings. Okay. Footprints and Shadowy Figures. This is a World War I novel. This was written by K.K. Sullivan. It has one rating at five stars. <laughs> so, uh, no additional genre tags to tell you about. On the battlefield, a bullet knows no color. A black unit and a white unit join together as American soldiers to fight in the war to end all wars. In footprints and shadowy figures, readers will, ex readers will experience the horrors of war. We're readers, not raiders. Readers. <laughs> Along with the brotherhood in arms. Men of every race, culture, and heritage fight shoulder to shoulder toward a common goal. And that's all it says. And then it's how great the author crafted this book. So, very short synopsis. Heir to a Prophecy, written by Mercedes Rochelle, has 59 ratings with a 4.15 average. The additional genre tag is Scotland. <clears throat> Shakespeare's witches tell Banquo, thou shalt get kings, though thou be none. Though Banquo is murdered, his son Flance gets away. What happened to Flance? I have no idea how to say that word, <laughs> that name. As Shakespeare audience, Shakespeare's audience apparently, apparently knew, Banquo was the ancestor of the royal Stuart line. But the road to kingship had a most inauspicious beginning, and we follow Flance into exile and death, bestowing the witch's prophecy on his illegitimate son, Walter. Born in Wales and raised in disgrace, Walter's efforts to understand Banquo's murder and honor his lineage take him on a long and treacherous journey through England and France before facing his destiny in Scotland. I am still confused by that, so I'm not quite sure what it's about, but whenever it is that I pick that book up, then I'll know. Okay, next I have Turpin's Assassin, Hero, Highwayman, Legend. Uh, this is written by Richard Foreman. It has 12 ratings with a 3.83 average. Additional genre tags? There are none. Um, I do see that this is going to be considered a novella. It does say this is 139 pages or a short story. Okay. Um, okay, the highwayman Dick Turpin is now as famous as he is infamous. His next ride could be his last. Turpin travels to London to sell on his latest haul to the fence Joseph Coleman and see his mistress, the actress Marie Harley. But the aristocrat and assassin, Pierre Verger. Okay, but the aristocrat and assassin, Pierre Verger, has also recently traveled to the capital. The Frenchman is a hunter, and he has been given the name of his next prey. But all this, but all is not what it seems. Turpin negotiates his way through the criminal underworld and English society, realizing that no soul is free from sin or folly, including his own. The hunter will become the hunted and the outlaw will seek justice. And then it's how recommended for fans of such and such, like fans of Bernard Cor Cornwell, Michael Jax, and Andrew Taylor. Never heard of those ones, so if you have, then maybe you'll like this one too. Okay. Moving on, I have The Rosy View of the World, One Woman's Journey Through the 20th Century. This was written by Andrew Bassett. It has 36 ratings with a 4.47 average and no additional genre tags to tell you about. It says, Rosie had a front row seat in a changing world, but she soon left her seat to push for change, real change. In doing this, Rosie showed her son, the author, the courage needed to fight the obstacles holding him back in his own life. Her life became his greatest story, the story he had to tell. Okay, so this is based on his mother, it sounds like, okay. As she told her soldier husband, the man who broke her heart, the point is, husband of mine, I never cheated on you, even though you and the army left me alone for all those years. 
I spent more than half our marriage being more married to an idea than a man. I think you should say to me, thank you for your service. Isn't that what some people say to you who respect what you went through in Vietnam? Well, I went through a lot here at home, and I think I deserve some consideration. Okay, and that's what that one is. The last two books. Uh, this one is So Wild a Dream. This is book number one in the Rendezvous series, written by Wynne Belvins. It has 190 ratings with a 4.06 average. There are, let's see, two, three, four, five, six books in this series. Additional genre tags is Western. Okay. Wordcraft Native Circles winner. Okay, and winner of the Spur Award. All right, here we go. Here's the synopsis. Into a West, too unmapped for the explorers, too bad for the bad men, too wild for any white man, came too wild for any white man, came the mountain men. Okay, that just went over my head. And let's just continue. They blazed the trails across the Rocky Mountains, opened the vast country between the Missouri frontier and the Pacific, and they rose to the stuff of legends. Young Sam Morgan has itchy feet and a hungry spirit. In 1822, life in Pennsylvania feels too hemmed in. He nurtures a wild dream of woodsman's life, a truly free American life. But where? Perhaps the far west, since Captain Lewis and Clark came back. People are telling stories about the Shining Mountains. He sets off. Okay, I still, I guess this is a book about a journey. That's all I can gather from that. I'm kind of confused by it, so I'm just going to move on to the last book of this video, which is The Consorts, written by Melissa Addy. This is book number one in the Forbidden series. This has 930 ratings with a 3.89 average. This has three, four, four books in this series. Additional genre tags, we have Romance, China, LGBT, and lesbian are the tags. Okay. Lonely, used as a pawn, one last bid for love. 18th century China, imperial concubine, Queen, King, I'm, I'm not sure how to say it. It's Q-I-N-G, Queen, because I want to say quilt, but that's it with a U. So King, I don't know. Uh, yearns for love and friendship. Neglected by the emperor, passed over for more ambitious women, king lives a lonely existence. I'm going to say king. <laughs> okay. Uh, but when a new concubine comes to court, friendship blooms, bringing with it a taste of happiness. For the first time in her life, king has a friend and perhaps even a chance at loving and being loved. But when the empress... Empress's throne suddenly becomes available. King finds herself being used as a pawn by the highest ranked women of the court. Caught up in their power games on one devastating night, everything she holds dear is put at risk. As the power players of the Forbidden City make their moves, can King find the courage to make one last bid for love? Can an insignificant pawn snatch victory from the jaws of defeat? And it says this is a prequel novella to The Forbidden City. So even though it's listed as book number one, it does say it is a prequel novella. So, uh, yeah, so that is it. Those are all of my historical fiction books for this particular haul. Let me know, have you read any of these books? Or have you read books from any of these authors? Do any of these books sound particularly intriguing to you? Definitely let me know. Talk to me in the comment section below. And until next time, stay true to yourself and enjoy a good book, and I will talk to you later.